All right, thank you so much for having me today. I would like to start out with prayer. God's put this message on my heart, and I want to honor that and go forth with that. So let's, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this fantastic message you've put on my heart, Lord. Thank you for just fostering it there, God, and, help, and helping it grow, Lord, and everything that you brought into my heart and what we've, I've studied and I've learned. And I just pray and ask, God, that this message would touch the hearts of everybody in this audience today, God, and that there would be life change in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. So, my message today is, God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. I'm going to say promise a lot tonight, because I, I really want to drive this home. Because I believe that we've all kind of been someplace in our life where we don't exactly understand some of the promises, or we haven't really fully stepped into them, trusted them, or even realized what God's really doing in our lives. And today, I want to, I want to dive into that. And uh, basically... To begin with, I want to share with you how God's promise for my life came about. And it began with um, a little bit about myself. I have uh, two brothers, mother and a father, and I grew up in Michigan, so I got to do the hand thing. So there, right about there, okay? A little near the border there, but... Yeah, it's just a Michigan thing. You got to point in your hand. Nobody knows where that actually is. But I'm like, you know, Fenton. Mm-hmm, duh, it's right, right about there. So, I mean, like, of course, nobody knows what that is. But there's a lot of little Michigan things. It's, it's fun. But anyways, I, I grew up in Fenton and born and raised. My father worked for GM. He was an ex-mechanic from the military. And um, he got a job as a technical writer. Now, life was great. Um, went to church a lot. But... I was beginning to learn the real life lessons about trusting in God and trusting the promise because I don't know if you, um, well, I'm sure you all remember the kind of recession and the cutbacks and stuff, specifically in the automotive field. Around 2003, my father did not get his contract renewed with um, uh, GM. And unfortunately, because of that, he had to go pretty much back to wrenching on bikes. (laughs) He'd go from an office job where he's doing a technical writing and editing. Uh, manuals to wrench and bikes. Now, he liked that, but it wasn't paying the bills. However, my father, over the years, had built up his faith, him and my mother, and at no point in the, during the stress did I ever feel like we were losing money, we were getting poor. He just provided. And when things were looking grim and dim, my dad got a job offer at McNeilis in Minnesota. So I spent 10 years in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> McNeil has packed up our entire family. So I'm just getting out of high school. I'm like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. Whatever. So he packed up our whole family, two full semis of my, our entire life. One semi was just my dad's pole barn. And all his, are you watching this, dad? Junk. No, I'm just joking. We had a lot of cool stuff. But they packed up everything. Our whole lives. We moved out there. And yes, a, a year later, McNeil goes up to my dad and says, man, it's been great, Tim, but... We can't afford you. You're fired. <laughs> and um, side note, we got to trust in God even more now, because now my dad's laid off again. And we still haven't sold the house back in Fenton. And we just put a new mortgage on the new house. So, yeah, that situation wasn't playing out well. I remember being, like, sick for two days. My dad walks downstairs. It's like, hey, son, I got laid off today. I'm going to go make a sandwich. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he said something like that. I remember, and I'll never forget, I remember sitting there kind of in the dark and staring going, oh, crap. (laughs) And I was sick to my stomach. And um, you begin to really, really start, when you read the Bible, you really start to have to, at some point in your life, really have to apply when Jesus talks about not worrying. Those are the times. Those are the times in life where you really have to go, is the Bible really true? Is this really going to work out? Do we really trust in God's word? My dad had to leave for South Carolina to get more work as a technical writer, and he was gone for a while. And it was hard. It was hard in the, in the family. But I reflected on the stories in the Old Testament of all places. In tonight's case, the story of Jacob, I affirmed within myself that I choose to trust God, that God would take care of my family. We prayed, we served. We continue to wait upon the Lord. 
Isaiah 40, uh, chapter 40, verse 28 to 31 says this. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. End of the story, through all the struggle, my dad got a job in Minnesota again at BAE. They design and produce military vehicles. Needless to say, my dad, uh, I believe he can... He doubled his pay, uh, easy, and uh, he still works there today. Now, just as my family received God's promises, so can you receive promises for your life, because God's got a ton of promises for you. Everyone's life is tied to promises that are made by God, and God keeps his promises. God's word is built upon many promises. Some are directly to you and his people. Such promises include to strengthen you, to give you rest, take care of your needs, answer your prayers, to work out everything for your good, to be with you, to protect you, to heal you emotionally and physically, and give you freedom from your sins, just to name a few. The Word of God contains many promises to us, and the Word of God has this ongoing promise to save His people from their sins. The Old Testament is like this slow, burning buildup of God's promise for humanity by securing the bloodline of Jesus Christ and then unfolding this epic climax when Jesus is fulfilling this promise. And now we see the, continue, the story continue to unfold as we come closer and closer to the conclusion, Revelations. I, uh, <laughs> I, I kind of pictured uh, God's promise for humanity, uh, well, God's promise and humanity's redemption, I should say, being played out kind of like the Marvel movies. Has anybody seen all the Marvel movies? Of course you've seen the Marvel movies. He hasn't seen them. Uh, anybody? Everybody? Show of hands. Okay, good. <laughs> Otherwise, this is going to get really weird real fast. Well, <laughs> to be fair, it's already going to get weird. All right, here we go. If you watch them, and I recommend that you watch them in order. They got like the special order on Disney Plus. You can watch them. You now you start with Captain America when they introduce all the stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so if you watch them in order, the sal okay, now bear with me here. The salvation promise in the Old Testament is kind of like the Infinity Stones, in that they are this constant, unwavering force that the heroes are in some form or another tied to. Okay? In the Avenger movies reveal that the stones are going to provide the heroes with an epic conclusion, one that cannot be altered, a preparation for the arrival of a certain character. The conclusion is the Endgame movies and the arrival of Thanos, in this case, Jesus Christ. Now hold on. <laughs> Fulfills the promise of these stones, of which was always to be decided by the user. Jesus snaps his fingers and saves humanity. Okay, that was kind of a really weird illustration. But <laughs> my point is the Word of God, the Bible, has this promise from beginning to end. As big and epic as the plan, that is the promise. God has a special place with you in mind. As big and epic as it is, you're, you are not just some minor character in the background of the Avengers movies. You're important, you're special. You only need to receive it. So if you have your Bibles with you today, I want to pull from, uh, even though we're going to be talking about my, my man Jacob today, we're going to be reflecting from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 through 12. So I'll give you a second to uh, get there. I'm losing a little bit of blood in this hand. <laughs> I, had, I pinched a nerve when I was working my first jobs. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. Through 12, and um, ever since then, I can't hold it for too long. I play drums, and so sometimes I'll go one hand and keep playing. It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes yeah, you gotta pray on that drum set, and God gives me back the power. I'm like, yes, all right, Holy Spirit, moving. 
All right, I'm going to read. So Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 12. By faith, Abraham, when called to the place where he would later receive his inheritance, obeyed and went. And even though he didn't know where he was going, by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents. So did Isaac and Jacob, who were, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was, was able to bear children, because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he is as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and countless as the sands on the seashore. My message today revolves around the story of Jacob. The story of Jacob is, is fantastic. Um, I don't really, th HBO and Netflix, they could really, they got amazing material. They would totally ruin it. They would totally ruin it. Because um, <laughs> there's just so much there. I don't think anybody could do it justice. But if they could, the stories in the Old Testament are just fantastic. They're very epic. But, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to highlight critical parts in the story relative to the promise God bestowed on us for our redemption. I'm going to highlight three points later in this abridged story of Jacob's life. All right? So I encourage you to be thinking about what they might be. So. Now, we need to set up Jacob's story by explaining a little bit of his backstory, what happened um, right up to Jacob's birth. Now, God has this promise, promise, mind you, to save humanity all the way back in the beginning of Genesis. Uh, chapter 3, verse 15, with Eve, when God promised all her descendants would struggle against the enemy, but also saying that the descendants, eventually to Jesus, would crush the head of the serpent, Satan. From here we begin humanity's epic dramas of the patriarchs, from the most notable patriarchs, Noah, to Abraham, to Isaac, and then to Jacob. Isaac bore two twin sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob's Hebrew name translates to he deceives, foreshadowing his personality. God tells Isaac's wife, Rebekah, that there were two nations within her room. Um, room, I just say that. I say, God tells Isaac's wife, Rebekah, there we go, that there were two nations within her womb who would become divided. One would be stronger than the other, and the older would serve the younger. So we begin our story, in case you want to know where Jacob's story is, is in uh, Genesis chapter 25. All right? So uh, Jacob is a trickster. Uh, he's quite good at it, as you're going to see. He begins by fooling his brother to sell him his birthright. So the kind of story there, in case you didn't know, is he's... He, uh, brother comes in, he's a great hunter, and uh, Jacob is not. But Jacob's smart, and uh, he tricks him because he's, just, he's really hungry. And he's like, hey, uh, give me your birthright, and I'll feed you. He's like, all right, fine. He just drops all his, <laughs> his bow and spears, like, whatever. Uh, Bible, I believe, would call him like a fool. Uh, to begin, he fools his brother to sell him his birthright. Then to secure this, Jacob fools his now blind father, Isaac, uh, his mother's idea biblically speaking, to be fair, because there was a show of favoritism, that he was Esau. So Isaac passes on his, his blessing to Jacob because he's blind. He doesn't realize and he touches and he thinks it's the, his hairy son's arm, Esau, but um, Isaac fools him. And consequently, uh, Esau wants to kill Jacob because he just, <laughs> he just uh, stole his blessing. Now, Rebekah tells Jacob to flee to the land of Haran, Haran? Haran. To see his uncle Laban and find a wife. On his journey, Jacob has a dream of a ladder to heaven. With God at the top, angels ascending and descending, God right now is giving Jacob assurance of his presence and reiterates his promise to Abraham, the promise of descendants. Jacob thereby named the place where he had this dream Bethel, which means house of God. And he vowed to serve God. Now, uh, this is a neat part of the story because Jacob kind of gets a taste of his own medicine. 
okay? He's uh, working for his uncle Laban for seven years for his daughter Rachel, whom Jacob deeply loved, all right? But Laban switched his older daughter uh, Leah for, for Rachel on their wedding night. That's <laughs> pretty messed up. Despite this deception, Laban agreed to give Jacob Rachel if he worked for him another seven years. So the trickster got tricked. Ironic. Love Bible stories. After this, God commands Jacob to return to the land of his father. On his way, Jacob had to face his brother Esau. Welcome back. You thought you could get away. I don't think so. It has been 20 years since they've seen each other. Now messengers told Jacob that Esau was coming to meet him with 400 men. You can imagine Jacob was like, it's over. I had a good run, you know. <laughs> Jacob prays for God to save him. He reminds God that he called him back to the land of Abraham and promised him to make prosper in his descendants. Alone, in the dead of the night, and afraid for his life, Jacob wrestled with a man he later learned was God. And by daybreak, Jacob still refused to let the man go, and he demanded the, the man, God, for a blessing, despite the man spraining the socket in Jacob's hip. But he still wouldn't let go. The man asked for Jacob's name, and told, and the man told him that his name would no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because he struggled with God and with humans and has overcome. Jacob named the place Penal, I believe that's how it's called, recognizing that he has seen God and God has spared his life. Fantastic story. And real side note, when someone gets their name changed in the Bible, it's a big deal. It's in a way like a baptism. The old life is gone, and you're coming forth, and you have a new life. And so in this case, this is happening to Jacob. Same one with um, Saul to Paul, okay? It marked a new beginning for Jacob. It made him a changed man. When he was reunited with Esau, Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. That's the best kind of brotherly love right there. When you just really, like, do something really stupid and <laughs> trash, Josh, I know you're watching. <laughs> You've done something really bad, but you guys both really love each other. And he comes like, oh, I love you, man. We just hug and cry. You know, in just a second ago, we were trying to kill each other. Literally. <laughs> now, Esau offered to accompany Jacob the rest of the way. But Jacob was still suspicious of his brother. And even though they loved each other, family deception, suspicions, and favoritism, like I mentioned earlier, continued, as we see this plays out with Jacob's son Joseph and his siblings. The story with Joseph, as some of you are familiar. The last important part of Jacob's story is how he gave his blessings to his sons. To Joseph, before Jacob died, he carried out God's promise. But he did it in the way that honored God's promise. He lifted up his hands and crossed his arms, blessing Joseph's sons. He crossed his arms and gave his, he gave the youngest blessing with the right hand, which in the Bible is kind of like a symbolism of power. Let me be at the right hand of God. But he assured Joseph that God's promise would still be fulfilled. It was further fulfilled with Jacob's son, Judah, whose line brought King David, which eventually led to Jesus, fulfilling that which God commanded of him. Now Jacob received his promise from God, and I honestly, I honestly don't think he understood or realized the magnitude okay, of what he was really getting himself into. I believe that Jacob didn't even know all of how or what kind of events came before he received that dream. Receiving that promise from God and how much of everything had led up to this very point. He probably he couldn't even grasp it. Or how much was riding on his ability to carry out and protect the promise that God had given him. So I reflected a little bit on uh, John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And whoever, who, whomsoever shall believe in him shall have everlasting life. But I really like the verse after it. Where Jesus continued saying, For the Son of Man did not come to condemn the world, but he came to save the world. He came to fulfill that promise. 
And he's been, he was trying to teach it to so many. Jesus was fulfilling and continuing a promise that was set into motion at the beginning of the world, like we talked about earlier, with the crushing of the head of the snake. When we accept God as our Lord and Savior, we are trusting in the promises of the Bible, accepting a promise long before our birth by putting faith in God where we are acknowledging the validity. I think I said the What? Validity. Thank you. My wife. <laughs> of his word and the promises that we are receiving from it. Okay, so three points I want to draw from this story. And thank you all for sit, sit paying attention. I tried to make, I, I really like telling that story. I, I really do like it. Point number one, you receive the promise. You don't make it. You receive God's promise. You don't get to make it. We see that Jacob is clever. He's a trickster, okay? To his credit, Jacob was smart and cunning, but it doesn't excuse for the wrong things he did. Ultimately, trying to, to uh, time, at times to change or adjust the direction of God's plan. God's promise for us was nothing that Jacob could possibly change despite his best efforts. God did, however, still choose Jacob, okay, which was one of my, my favorite things about God. He uses us, but he doesn't really have to. God doesn't have to use us. He chooses to use people, or he uses people, uh, as the Bible would say, as Mark clay, people that are broken. He lifts them up and he makes them into kings. So how many, so my question for you is, how many times in life do we, we tweak something into our favor? According to Wikipedia, the deflate gate controversy was national football, was the NFL controversy involving the allegation of the New England Patriots quarterback Tom Brady ordered the, de the deliberate deflation of footballs using the Patriots' victory against the Indi Indianapolis Colts. 2014 American Football Conference AFC Championship game. The controversy resulted in Brady being suspended for up to four games, and the team was fined $1 million. And they, forfeit, they forfeited two draft selections in 2016. Did Tom Brady really need to do that? I mean, it's Tom Brady, you know? The man could throw a football, all right? Or did he just want to change the game to make it a little easier for himself? This is what I'm talking about. This is, the, this is the tweaking. When we digest scripture, when we pray, when we meditate, we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us, don't we ask God to show us his biblical promises, his plan for our lives? Will it not challenge you? Will it not change you? If we're being honest with ourselves, we don't always play right by the rules. We tweak them a little bit to serve our best interests. Kind of like Jacob. But God won't have that. <laughs> but God won't reject us either. Do you, do you recall the old saying, uh, Mama knows best? I keep referring to my family. I'm sorry. It's a bad habit. But let me tell you. Ask me how I know this. <laughs> Every time. I, I kid you not. Mom would suggest something. I'd be like, uh -huh, well, yeah, I understand, Mom. But I got it. You know, I'm, I'm fine. I'm good. I got it. Don't worry about it. I messed it up. I messed up. <laughs> and mom would find out. And she'd, like, you know, she'd, she'd look at me. I was like, don't say anything. You were right. You were right. <laughs> For one of God's names in the Bible is Abba, Father, the good Father. Jesus solidifies this in this parable with the birds of the air and how they're taken care of. How much more will he take care of his children? Though we don't understand what's going on in our lives, if we are listening and following Jesus, he promises us to keep us aligned with his plan for our lives when we choose Jesus because he chose us first. He revealed truth to us in love. God keeps his promises. My second point, you will wrestle with the promise. You really will. No matter how good your intention is, you will still at some point wrestle with what God's trying to do in your life. And if you aren't wrestling with God, I would really question if that's actually God working in your life. God's honest truth. All right? Like I said just earlier, God wants to change us. He wants to mold us. It's a part of growing as a Christian. So if you're not wrestling with something that's kind of conflicting you with your flesh, the, the part of you that wants to commit sin, then I would really question if, um, 
you're really speaking with the Lord if he's not put something on your heart, because you should be wrestling with it. We don't always get all the answers right away, but we must trust the process. So when I was, in, when I was at NCU, I, got, um, uh, I went to North Carolina University, and I got my bachelor's in uh, pastoral studies there. There, was several, um, there were several chapel services that I remembered, one of which really struck me, and it was this man. We walk in, he's sitting on the stage in a chair, and he's faced to the wall. And on the screen, it's got pictures of him and, him and his little girl. He explains that, um, well, he tells the story about how he lost his little girl. Um, and it was tragic. It was a sickness. And how he wrestled with God. How he struggled to understand what was going on. And it was a long and grievous process. But he got to a part where he was trying to sleep one night and he fell on the floor. And he, and he says, like, I don't know what's going on. I just don't know if I trust what you're doing. And God revealed something to him that was so profound. And it didn't make the situation any easier. But God explained to him in those moments that his little girl wasn't his. His little girl was God's was his, was, was, was God, was God's. His little girl didn't belong to him, belonged to God. And I can't imagine receiving that kind of information because you think, it's like, oh, I kind of, you know, understand. there's no understanding in losing your child. I'm not going to stand up here and try to even fathom that. But he wrestled with it. He got on his knees and he still asked for God's help despite everything. So much so that he made on the stage, you know, I have a relationship with Jesus, but I still struggle with this. And this is what God gave me. And so he gave everybody in the entire audience a black piece of cloth. And if I remember correctly, it was like when his child was torn from him. It was like this torn piece of black cloth. And I still have that piece of cloth today. And I carry that with me. Help remind me about how, the, how this man wrestled, wrestled with God, wrestled with, wrestled with things he could not fathom. We may not understand the tragedy or the struggle or the why, but God, he never abandons us. Never to forsake you for the wrong you've committed or to the one committing the wrong to you. God's mercy and love I find is a deep, profound mystery. But through it all, the death, the anger, the lies, the evil, God is merciful and is ready to correct the path and give hope to those, to anyone who wants to reach out and grab it. To stand as perfect righteousness in a world that rejects righteousness on a daily basis. And eventually, we don't always choose the light. We wrestle with it. And eventually, wrestling with God like Jacob did. The beauty is God lets us wrestle with him. He's going to let you wrestle with him. It's like, come to me. Go ahead. You got a problem? Let's talk about it. I know you hate me for it. I know you're struggling with it. But I'm going to reveal things to you that only you're going to know, that only you're going to understand, that only you're going to appreciate, because you chose to follow me. And yeah, the world's full of sin. There's consequences. But I have not abandoned you. I have a plan for you. We eventually wrestle, wrestle with God like Jacob did. The beauty is God lets us wrestle with him, lets us ask questions, lets us question his decisions, lets us ask for the impossible because he promises to deliver us to one way or another. He lets us mock him, walk away from him, beat him down, spit in his face, and hang him on a cross for all to see. And he still loves us. God will always make a way back to, back to him. Part of growing closer to God is wrestling with him and chasing after the promises. And it will be like Jesus' parable of the prodigal son coming home from being and being received in joy and celebration. Despite everything, it marks new beginnings. Just like Jacob receiving his new name, Israel, after he wrestled with God. This was always the plan. 
It always had purpose. There's always a promise to keep. Because God keeps his promises. Third and final point. You honor God's promises. You honor them. You don't tweak them. You wrestle with them. But you do go ahead and you honor them. And say, look, look at what my God, look what my God can do. And you stand up and you honor that. In the same way Jacob honored God by making sure he returned to the land of his forefathers, Abraham, and properly bestowed blessings and birthright to his sons and grandsons, so must we live in a life honored to honor God's promises. God bestows many promises throughout the Bible. Some we know, some we may have forgotten, others we're just waiting to discover so we continue to read. God wants you to walk in his promises for your life. And Jesus asks us to share these promises. He asks us in this in the Great Commission and to love one another as we love ourselves. My conclusion is this. There is a promise right now for your circumstances in your life right now. I wouldn't be telling this message tonight if the Lord hadn't put it on my heart to begin with. I'm like, what should I even preach about, God? And I had this, I had this message in like, <laughs> on my iPad, and it was about God's promises. I preached this message like at this point almost like 10 years ago. But it had always been there. I'm like, this is something that everyone can hear. And everybody can grasp. There is a promise for your circumstance tonight. As we learn to walk with Jesus and receive promises, they give out our lives with the best results. But they also force us to wrestle with ourselves. But in the end, when we have grown wiser and stronger and bolder, can we disciple and share God's love and promise to others? There are people here tonight, possibly. I believe this God's touched on my heart. There are people tonight, some of you don't fully trust in God's promises. I know, I've been there. Life has beached down, and it's hard to trust in the idea that God has your best interests sometimes. It really, it really is. But you know what? Tonight, God wants you to be realigned with him. He really does. This is my challenge for you today. I think every sermon should have a challenge at the end of it for everybody in the audience. My challenge to you today is to examine yourself. Lay out yourself bare before the Lord and really ask yourself where you are and where you're going. And what have you been kind of repressing? Is there something or someone keeping you from what God has promised you? Are you wrestling with where God, where God wants to be in your life, where you're going? Maybe it's your faith. Maybe you struggle to just act like a Christian, to share Christ with others. Or some of you here tonight, you may not even really know who Jesus is, and that's okay. It really is okay. Because I would love to pray with you, my wife, any of your deacons or leaders, of course, Pastor Kendall, just to have that conversation in private. It's like, I really, I really have been, I've, I either don't really know who Jesus is or I need to reconnect with him. I have no idea where I'm going or why I'm even showing to church, but I'm here because I'm thirsty. And I know the Lord gives living water. I'm going to pray tonight that the Lord is going to touch your heart tonight. And I'm going to ask you to step out of your comfort zone and trust in God's promises for your life. Because if there's one thing I've learned from this message today is that God always keeps his promises, both in the Bible, both in my own life. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. My question is, are you ready? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this night. Thank you so much, Lord, for this word you've put on my heart. It is an honor, Father God, to share it with my brothers and sisters. Lord, there are people at night that are struggling in some shape, form, or another, God. We're just going to pray and ask right now, Jesus, please, we reach out to you. Like children, we just simply ask God, we reach our hands and ask, Jesus, please come and touch my heart. Please come and touch my life. Reveal your promises to me, God. 
Reveal them to me in your word, Jesus. Lord, I just pray and ask God for everyone here tonight, God, that they would grow deeper in their relationship with you, Jesus. That they would discover things they had never discovered before. They would read an Old Testament story like Jacob and say, I see that now. I see the struggle. I see the humanity. I see me. I see the struggle. Whatever it is, Lord, I pray over this, over this congregation, Lord. In, the name, in Jesus' name, I pray and ask for healing, for trust, for love in everyone's lives. And Lord, whether it be by me or Pastor Kendall, whoever need prayer, I pray and ask God that they step out in faith. Because you're waiting, Jesus. You are waiting right now in this place. In your holy name, I pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it.